who will be joining shortly. All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Tools for Equity and Public Spending Recognition event. I am pleased to facilitate this morning. My name is Ian Huen. I do supplier diversity at the Office of Minority and Women's Business Enterprises, where I have the pleasure of working with the action teams that created these tools and also partnering with public agencies statewide to find ways to increase spending with small and diverse businesses. Me in the audience today are our partners from state agencies and public higher education institutions, as well as attendees from different cities, counties, and school districts. The launch of this toolkit is truly a momentous occasion. This is a culmination of efforts of both agencies and individuals over the last few years. This is how our state is implementing recommendations from the 2019 disparity study to help achieve statewide equity in public spending. On the agenda today, we will receive an overview of the governor's subcabinet and business diversity, the formation, past, current, and future work ahead. We will then hear from the Department of Veterans Affairs and an OMWB certified firm. We will preview the toolkit and the support session schedule. We will be joined by the governor and hear from the six business diversity subcabinet agencies on the steps they're taking towards equity, how we are moving forward on this work together, and recognition of individuals in the creation of this toolkit. We'll go over next steps and adjourn at noon. A few housekeeping items. Attendees will not be able to unmute themselves or turn on their cameras. We have a robust program today and a Q&A session has not been allotted, though we would love to hear from you. So uh, any comments, uh, please feel free to enter them in the chat box. And then if you have any questions, uh, please send them to equitytoolkit at omwbe.wa.gov. And with that, I'll go ahead and turn it over to our first presenters. Um, we have from DES, Chris Liu, and from OMWBE, we have Lisa Vanderloop. So good morning, everybody. Thank you for being here and welcome to Tools for Equity and Public Spending. Since many of you are here for the first time, I thought we should go over the events and milestones that got us here, sharing the tools for equity and public spending. Roughly six years ago, when we put our first scrum team together to address the inequities in public contracting in all sectors of government, we had people from many agencies who had experience in trying to address these inequities, some with success, but many without. The scrum team came up with a list of issues to be addressed. It was also recognized at that time we needed to have a legal analysis of I-200, an initiative often quoted, but rarely understood. We had Laura Watson, current, currently the director for ecology, who worked for the AG's office at that time, let, lead us to, to ask for a formal opinion from Attorney General Bob Ferguson. This opinion gave us the foundation to create a legal path for it to withstand the challenges and would reduce the risk we knew would come with our journey to business equity. We still use this map today to demonstrate the legal path we are following. On a parallel course, we asked the governor to form a subcabinet of the six largest agencies to lead the effort of business diversity and business equity. DES was appointed as the lead agency for the subcabinet. With these foundational activities and under the guidance of the subcabinet, we asked for and received the governor's support to move forward with the disparity study. The disparity study is a necessary step in establishing the direction and criteria for the state and ensure any risk of legal challenges would be reduced. The study also clearly articulates the problems we are trying to solve. Upon completion of the study, the results would be incorporated into the strategic direction of the subcabinet and form the legal basis for future change. Another important change that happened when the disparity study was completed was the change in leadership in the subcabinet from DES to OMWBE. OMWBE's statutory authority helped reduce the need for further legislative changes, and OMWBE's statutory reporting structure best fits the needs of the state. This brings us to today. 
We are light years ahead of where we started, but we still have a long way to go. And this is where you all come in. Lisa? I have to unmute first, that's helpful. <laughs> Okay, so thank you, Chris. And um, before I go any further, I, I, uh, to all of you, I want to personally recognize Chris for his leadership and partnership uh, in this work over the last few years. You know, Chris really led this and built the foundation for these efforts, and it's a large portion of why we're here. So thank you, Chris. And, and thank you, Chris, for mentioning the disparity study that was released on Juneteenth in 2019. After the release of the study, many of you or some of you are aware that Rex Brown and I visited about eight different locations around the state where we discussed the findings, the recommendations, and the steps the state planned on taking to affect long-term and substantial change to eliminate discrimination from our procurement and contracting practices. The interest and engagement from stakeholders was enheartening and it enforced the belief that this work that we're doing is as important as ever. And one of the joys of doing outreach is meeting people along the way. And when we were in Vancouver, Rex and I had the pleasure of meeting Nathan Webster, who I think may be on today. I'm not sure and if you are. Hi, Nathan, welcome. Uh, but he has been a great partner to OMWB. He's been particularly help to, helpful to us in the Vancouver area. So that's just uh, one of the perks of being able to do this work. Once we finished up the information tour on the disparity study, the sub cabinet went to work on planning and prioritizing um, the recommendations. And while there are many initiatives underway, we are here today to kick off the launch of the tools for equity and public spending. The suite of tools is the state's approach to creating standardized, standardized race and gender neutral measures. These measures are required next step for our state to address the systemic barriers small and diverse businesses experience. And it is important to note that the sub cabinet work is really a collaborative effort and the toolkit is so much stronger because we've had these voices at the table. We intend the implementation to be the same coordinated effort that requires all of our commitment. While all the tools are available now, OMWBE will introduce a tool quarterly and will host a series of support sessions to provide further guidance by the subject matter experts that created the tools. And these subject matter experts have been critical. Agencies will have the opportunity to learn from one another share each other's challenges and successes and continue collaboration across agencies. And now I'd just like to take a few moments to recognize some of the key people in this effort in addition to Chris. Uh, I wanna recognize Sarah Erdman, OMWBE's Deputy Director, who's really done a fantastic job over the last several months of keeping this work moving and, and her leadership has been so steady and appreciated. And of course, Rex Brown, who is the architect of the action teams that created the tools. Uh, he really is uh, the really the mastermind behind the disparity study and moving that forward and helping us interpret that. So a big thanks to Rex. Of course, Yan Huen, who facilitated and participated on many of the action teams, is our supplier diversity subject matter expert and has kept this work moving. Others include Caleb McInvale, who, you know, he brings a skill set of a legal lens, a technical guidance, and has just really been uh, all hands on deck and helped us along with Tim Kenny, who's our comms person, making sure the videos look good and we're plain talk. Joanna Idy, who many of you know is our government affairs uh, person, and she has really kept us in a strategic mode. It's been helpful. And of course, there's always uh, our operations and support, Jen Wilms and Nakia Titus, who really keep these me meetings scheduled and on time. And then our partners are, can't forget them, Stacia Haller, our sub cabinet AG, who gave us legal advice and guidance 
and looked at these tools prior to launching. And Ramona Neighbors, our, our own FM budget analyst. And the interesting about Ramona is uh, she's our partner. Of course, we go to her for funding, but she went that extra step of saying, hey, I want to learn about the sub cabinet. I want to learn about why you're asking for this funding. So so that you are, you know, I, I understand it completely. And with that, we were able to get the funding that we needed. So Ramona has been an important and crucial partner. And of course, Rochelle Davis, who has really demonstrated strong support and commitment to this effort and has been a great thought partner. And of course, our ethnic commissions, you know, Ed, Toshiko, uh, Maria, you know, just your input has been critical. You've brought that equity lens that is so important. And, and we thank you. And in closing, I just want to reiterate what we already know, which is the state of Washington does, the way we do business in the state of Washington can support a resilient economy, which strengthens our communities and improves the quality of life for our residents. So I thank you for being here today. We look forward to working with you. Thank you, Lisa. And now we'll turn it over to Department of Veterans Affairs, Alfie Alvarado Ramos. Looks like Alfie hasn't joined us yet, Yen. So if you could move along in your session, um, I haven't seen her join as a panelist yet. Okay, sure thing. So next up, we have an OMWB certified firm, um, Regina Glenn. Good morning. It is a pleasure to be representing your stakeholders. I uh, support this office in so many ways for over a decade. It's amazing how many times I look at the opportunities to serve and on um, your advisory committee, providing insights and recommendations from a small business perspective. I speak on behalf of the office at legislative hearings upon the request of the office. And more importantly and often, I distribute information to our communities regarding policies, resources, especially like this toolkit. As a diversity and inclusion manager on several major public works projects, I see these programs uh, so important on the mega programs and others to assist our community of minority small business veterans and women owned businesses to navigate through these very complicated uh, rules and regulations of the contract process and to meet the right people. We also support owners and primes in reaching out to find those firms that we know have the services and the, the skills that we need. Next slide. Um, Yen, the next slide. So the benefits of this, as a, a certified firm, it's critical for the stakeholders, for us to see that the owners, like Warstad and all the partners today, that your commitment to diversity is there and you prove it by providing us guidance on how we can be compliant, how the primes can be compliant. And you've done this at OMWBE and you picked up your game tremendously providing prompt certification, providing accurate updated directories of certified firms. And you form these strategic alliances as you did with this project and so many more with our communities, our advocacy groups, as well as other agencies. And the technical support, this toolkit is a jewel in that kit of many areas that you provide technical support both in person and online. Next slide. The toolkit I want to point out is especially unique and necessary because it provides us that guidance to all of our partners, the Washdot family, the other agencies, state agencies, the subcontractors, and the primes. With these tools, step-by-step -step guides on how the staff can put the language in the contract. We all know primes will not be ambiguous about contract expectation when it's written in the contract. What is a particular note in this worksheet that you have, of oh, not the worksheet, but if you will, the toolkit, it talks about after the event, which is great. And that is a checklist that you have for how to do an outreach session. I found that particularly helpful for all of us 
who do those outreach sessions, but also for those who attend, they can see the kind of follow-up they should look for. Information provided in the inclusion guide is outstanding. The plans and the templates allow for primes not to guess about what is requested. For subcontractors now to have a better idea of their worth for the primes to be successful. WashDOT staff has the ready tools and giving us this uniformity to put that in the contract language. Additionally, the outreach checklist, again, it not only tells you what to do, but why you're doing it and how to do it. It is a pleasure to see this toolkit for our many, many stakeholders. Thank you. Thank you so much, Regina. Um, Yen, just really quickly, it looks like Alfie's just joined us, so if we can jump back to her section. Oh, wonderful. Let me just get there. All right. Thank you so much, and I really appreciate the flexibility. And uh, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, your Washington Department of Veterans Affairs but also how important this toolkit is to be able to reflect uh, being able to do business with uh, veteran-owned businesses. Uh, uh, your Washington Department of Veterans Affairs is, is the smallest of the large agencies in Washington state, and we are committed to invest on our veterans, minority, and women-owned businesses. Uh, this toolkit is really important because for small agencies and small businesses, it is critical to be able to have information all in one place. And uh, one of those areas where you're going to be finding uh, information when it comes to business with uh, state, uh, with veteran owned businesses is going to be in our website. Uh, and uh, the fact that along with OWMB, we also have a certification that is uh, directly attributed for the military service and business ownership by veterans. And there are only three things that are required for someone to be able to, to be certified uh, after joining WEBS. Uh, it's a certificate of uh, honorable discharge, 51% uh, ownership or 50-50 split between two veterans or a community property like a spouse, and proof of business incorporation in Washington state. So it's very simple for someone to be able to get certified as a veteran on business. And this is not the same as the federal program. This is much easier and it's just specific to Washington State. Next slide, please. So why is it important to seek and invest on veteran owned businesses? Well, as you know, the military is highly diverse and uh, it, it increases the probabilities of being able to get a, also a minority or woman owned business when you, you uh, select uh, being able to do uh, business with a veteran own. Uh, veterans place their lives to hold and hold to serve their country and start businesses later than their counterparts. So it's important to be able to have that consideration also. Uh, veteran owned businesses hire veterans and military spouses, and they often experience employment challenges due to frequent moves and the nature of military service. And it's also your way to say thank you for your service in a meaningful way to competitive companies that have in that corporate fabric, the military ethos of ethics, teamwork, timeliness, diversity, agility, and service. So along with all that you're going to be exposed with uh, through the rest of this uh, session today, uh, think veteran because you are going to be saying thank you for your service in a very meaningful way. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alfie. All right, so next up, uh, we have myself with a uh, demo of the toolkit. All right. So what we have here is just the homepage uh, for OMWBE. So omwbe.wa.gov, this is what you'll see. Um, and then if you'll hover over supplier diversity, the first um, list item that comes up is tools for equity and public spending. 
Great. So as you can see here, we have a number of different uh, tool categories. We have planning and forecasting, master contracts, internal processes, outreach, inclusion plans, and also um, a list of supplier diversity partner resources as well. Just going to take us through um, briefly each one. And what you'll find is um, a short video. Welcome to the Washington State Tools for Equity and Public Spending. In this section, we'll look at planning and forecasting. Forecasting future spending helps agencies plan ahead, and sharing these plans with enough lead time helps businesses prepare for procurement opportunities. This is particularly important for small and diverse businesses that may have difficulty responding to solicitations with short notice. Regular planning and forecasting help agencies track performance, ensuring every purchase is a planned purchase. Early planning is the key to identifying areas to spend with small and diverse businesses. Use the tools on this page to help your agency forecast future spending. So in addition to a video, um, under the video you'll see uh, one or two or sometimes a number of different tools uh, that go with that category. So for planning and forecasting, we have this uh, forecasting FAQ, which introduces planning and forecasting, explains why it is important in supporting supplier diversity and recommends forecasting strategies that help both agencies and small and diverse businesses. Next, we have master contracts. Um, video as well. And then here we have the master contracts FAQ um, that introduces master contracts when they are required and how to identify opportunities for diverse businesses. Um, here's another, uh, I'm hovering over it now, here's another tool as well. Uh, this is the guidelines on how to proactively identify diversity on DES master contracts. Next we have Internal processes. Internal processes has a number of tools. We have contract language best practices that discusses contract language that agencies can use to reduce barriers for small and diverse businesses. It also suggests contract terms that show Washington's commitment to equity and providing opportunities for diverse businesses. We have an unbundling FAQ that introduces unbundling and how it can be used to create meaningful opportunities for small and diverse businesses. And then we have supplier diversity best practices here at the bottom that includes general steps for agencies to increase equity and in state spending. <clears throat> Outreach also has a number of tools. We have the Outreach FAQ that introduces the different ways agencies can reach out to small and diverse companies. Outreach plans, which helps agencies develop a plan to make all businesses aware of opportunities. We have components of an outreach plan, which lists tools and resources for agencies who are developing their outreach strategy. An outreach event checklist, it includes a checklist for agency employees to make sure they are prepared for an outreach event. Um, and then last year, we have targeted outreach recommendations, which provides recommendations to agencies on how to best reach many small and diverse businesses. Uh, the last set of tools here is inclusion plans. Inclusion plans FAQ, and then we also have an inclusion plan guide and template. The FAQ introduces inclusion plans and discusses how they help small and diverse businesses work with the government. Uh, the inclusion plan guide and template gives guidance on what should be included in an inclusion plan and has a template to get started. Uh, additionally, listed are links to example inclusion plans as well. On the supplier diversity resource tab, you'll find a major annual government contracting and procurement events that are listed here, as well as uh, partners statewide, interjurisdictional, and other stakeholder organizations. We also included the Institute for Diversity Certification here um, at the bottom here uh, as an education resource. This is an ever-growing partner resource list, so please check back often. And if there is a resource you may not or you may know of that is not listed here, please let us know by emailing equitytoolkit at ownwbe.wa.gov.
So that is um, uh, just a quick run through of the tools for equity and public spending. Um, so in addition to the tools, we also have a, a schedule of support sessions for the year. So here's our schedule of support sessions. Um, you'll see it's uh, in four different groups here. We have forecasting and master contracts, which will be in um, February, March, and April. We have internal processes, outreach, and then inclusion plans. So the idea here is that um, it's a series. Each category is a series of three different sessions. Uh, the initial one, so let's pick on forecasting here. The initial uh, session in February will be an introduction uh, to meet the subject matter experts that created this tool um, and learn why these tools are needed and ideas for successful implementation. And then a month later, um, come back in March and that is the first support session. You can join with colleagues from different agencies, share your plans for implementation, ask questions and get ideas. And then, uh, the, then you come back the third time and that's April. And so that'll be the follow-up support sessions where you'll share your implementation progress, lessons learned and successes, ask questions and network with colleagues from different cities also joining in this work. And at the end of this session, um, the follow-up support session, agencies should have implemented these tools and are ready for the next set of tools. And then we'll transition to the next three series, uh, which in this case is internal processes and uh, so on and, and move throughout the year. The last uh, support session is gonna be in January, January 11th of uh, next year. And then shortly after this event, um, you will uh, receive an email that also has a link uh, to register for all of these support sessions. Okay, and so um, get back to the PowerPoint here. And next up, we have a uh, hearing again from Chris Liu at the Department of Enterprise Services. I apologize, uh, uh, I was on mute and my, my camera wasn't on. Um, first of all, I wanted to share with you some of the information that we have on the DES website. This first roadmap you're, you're looking at is, is, a, uh, is really a roadmap to decision-making. Um, and it's really uh, targeted at agency directors, assist, deputy directors and assistant directors. It's decision-making ver uh, uh, for deciding when is it time to move to your next measure. As you can see, it's a pretty simplistic map about how well is your program doing and should I stay on this right path or should I make some changes in, in my program? So I'm not gonna read out this, this particular roadmap because I wanted to save some time for, uh, for my next slide. Could I have the next slide, please? So um, if you could, can, is there a, your, an ability to increase the size of this slide? Okay, if, if there isn't, um, I'll, I'll read to you uh, what's really on the slides. For, first of all, I want to explain, explain that this is only one roadmap, uh, one of two roadmaps that we have with, that we use in DES. This roadmap is for the contracts and procurement division we have a second roadmap for public works or what we call our facilities planning services, FPS. So this particular roadmap we call our PI roadmap and PI stands for procurement inclusion and equity. We started with a very simple Excel spreadsheet and ended up with what you see here today. The roadmap is first organized from left to right in broad categories. And as you move to the right, ending up in specific tasks and due dates. In the first column, here's how the contract and procurement has defined their scopes of work in that very first column. Um, data, creating a culture of procurement inclusion and equity, building a pipeline. In the second column, the scopes of work 
are then broken down into disparity recommendations that they are addressing. In the third column is the specific strategy that accomplishes dis the disparity study recommendation. And in the fourth column and further to the right are the specific tasks that satisfy the strategy. While the roadmap shows 12 months of activities, the detail in the map has 24 reporting periods. As we have biweekly huddles to track the progress of the division to ensure we are delivering what we said we were going to de deliver and address the disparity study itself. In the third column, there are specific strategies DES is working on in contracts and procurement. And as we go from top to bottom, since I know this is very small and you can't really read it, as an example, in the scope of work for data, the first, uh, I'm sorry, the first uh, task we have there is to create a direct buy tracking methodology. The second task is to create an Amazon spend tracking method. And the third thing is a data team to determine how to measure contracts and procurement spend trends with small, diverse, and veterans business. In the next larger scope of work we have is creating a culture of procurement inclusion and equity. We have as the strategy tasks, uh, publicly posting winning bids, extend the timeline solicitations that are available for businesses to bid on, follow unbundling multiple award guidances. The next one is the policy and training and to train for new solicitation processes, timing, unbundling, inclusion plans, insurance analysis. And I'm gonna come back to this particular task in a few moments and conduct stakeholder work, a policy development, implement quick pay policies and stakeholder input and follow new insurance guidance. That's what's in that second scope of work. So I wanna go back to the training policy and training piece. What you're gonna see in, a in our future roadmap because our roadmaps are dynamic and we change that depending on what we are discovering as we are doing our work. You'll see another scope of work that will, uh, will appear here uh, in the future, which is just about policy work and training work. As most of you know, DES work, uh, DES's contracts and procurement has two pieces to it. One is what is inward facing toward DES and DES specific, and what is statewide procurement policy. So we are discovering that we need to have a broader section and a more robust discussion about what those policies and training uh, for those policies are going to be. So we are changing the roadmap as we, we run into these things that we are discovering along the way. So we have a very similar roadmap uh, for uh, contracts, I'm, I'm sorry, for public works. And it, it is uh, more de uh, deeply detailed, sorry for the camera, more deeply detailed be because of the fact that, that uh, that our public works division has been doing roadmaps for diversity uh, for roughly four or five years. I think the, uh, it's probably one of the older ones. I think the um, Washtot and LNI probably have older maps than, than we have, or it's more mature in, in their process just simply because they've been doing it longer. So before, before my time runs out, I just wanted to thank some, some people in, in, at DES who have just been doing such tremendous work. While I represent the agency, the people who really do the work are, are really my heroes. So I'd like to recognize uh, Annette Meyer, Servando Pablan, um, Aaron Lopez, Shana Bearhan, uh, Jamie Rossman, Karina Cooper, Elena McGrew, Lindsay Aldridge, Howard Cox, ECMA, Rex Brown, Des McGarren, Charles Wilson, Janet Jansen, Bill Freire, Greg Tolbert, uh, Christine Warnock, Drew Zavatsky, uh, Linda Kent, Marissa Van Hoosier, and Linda Farmer. And I'm sure I'm leaving out some folks that, that I should recognize. I'd also like to recognize the, the folks at the AGO's office who really are our partners in helping to put some of our roadmap together because we pass everything that we do through the AG's office. Laura Watson, as I mentioned before, who really helped us out with our legal opinions. Stacia Holler, which, which uh, Lisa has already mentioned, and our, our yeoman on all these uh, on our legal issues, Don Cortez. So thank you to everybody for all that you do. 
because of all of you, we are, we are on our way to, for business equity. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. Here's my phone number in case you wanna ask me questions specifically about the maps. We're gonna send them out um, with, uh, with this presentation. It's area code 360-628-0058. Three six zero six two eight zero zero five eight. If you have any questions whatsoever about any of the work that DES is doing, feel free to to, uh, to phone me. I can be found at any number of stakeholder meetings. If you attend those stakeholder meetings, Tabor one hundred, uh, NAMAC, the Black Collective, uh, Jackal, um, I, you'll you'll find me at those meetings every Saturday uh, or on Saturdays or on Thursday nights or whenever those organizations meet. So feel free to ask me questions. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, Chris. I love that we have so much energy and excitement in this virtual room. Um, okay, so uh, next we're gonna go ahead and uh, turn it over to Dana Phelps and Carolyn Cole at the Department of Social and Health Services. And I'll go ahead and cue the slide. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be with you all today. Um, uh, and DSHS has been on this journey with DES and OMWBE um, uh, quite some time. Um, we really appreciate the partnership uh, and, and have a great deal of hope. And I just wanted to frame for uh, the participants um, the, the perspective that DSHS has about the investments in business diversity work and uh, building the amount of money that we spend with minority and women owned businesses in the state. Um, first off, we believe that um, spending by the state government on services or contracts um, uh, with minority and women owned businesses is an equity issue. Um, it can make a real difference uh, for those businesses but we also believe it can make a real difference for the clients that we serve who live in poverty. Um, small businesses often keep money in the community. They hire people who live in their communities and those are our clients. So in some ways to us, this is not only a way of uh, having diverse businesses support our work, but also a way to lift up our clients um, overall. And can we go to the next slide, please? For the reason that, that I just said, um, DSHS has invested uh, for some time in a opportunity team. We call it business inclusion opportunity team that comes together and talks about ways that we can improve our spending, our efforts, our strategies for business diversity um, uh, in our purchase of services. And to us, that also includes client services. Carolyn Cole, who's the top here on the list, has been facilitating this group for some time, and she'll tell you a little bit more about our thinking. Um, but here is an important group of people, a couple that I really want to highlight um, that have been participating. Ed Maynard is an expert in data about purchased services, purchased goods and services. Will Taplin has been uh, instrumental in helping design policies. Um, Monica Vassell uh, is a visionary in this area and really built out DSHS's contracts database to capture information in a, in a way that can help us move things ahead. Um, DSHS has a diverse set of clients and in order to meet their diverse needs, we need contractors and service providers that can meet them where they're at. And minority and business, uh, women owned businesses really are um, a vehicle to doing that. So with that said, um, I'm gonna turn this over to Carolyn Cole, um, who's gonna take you through our roadmap. Uh, and um, again, I really appreciate you all being on, on here and hearing about our efforts thus far. Go ahead, Carolyn. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Dana. Um, so good morning, business diversity sub-cabinet members and partners. It is a pleasure to be here today. Uh, DSHS is grateful for the opportunity to share our 2020 through 2023 business diversity roadmap. Um, and we look forward to implementing OMWBE's tools for equity in public spending. Um, next slide, please. So reading the roadmap from left to right, we see that DSHS has adopted voluntary goals. 
We convene business inclusion opportunity team meetings uh, monthly, and we review quarterly OMWBE diversity participation reports. In 2021, our focus will be to begin our client services inclusion pilot project, as well as begin implementation of the tools for equity in public spending. BIOT's organizational readiness needs and needs assessment determined that the tools for master contracts, internal processes, and outreach are the most appropriate to focus on this year for DSHS. If we see progress towards our voluntary goals, we will stay with the current program. If we do not, we will evaluate and implement mandatory race and gender neutral measures in 2022. The middle box lists some of the proposed measures uh, pending DSHS cabinet approval. These include administrative policy changes such as vendor usage refresh schedules for master contracts, mandatory vendor inclusion plans, dedicated resources for a business community outreach position, mandatory staff trainings and monitoring. If we are still unable to see progress towards voluntary goals, we will seek uh, Attorney General's consultation for race and gender conscious measures. This is also proposed and pending DSHS cabinet approval. We will measure our success in the following ways. Client services spend inclusion in OMWBE diversity participation reports, meeting or surpassing our voluntary goals, alignment of our internal policies with OMWBE model policies, and full integration of best practices and increased internal and business partnerships. Uh, next slide, please. I would now like to highlight DSHS's client services inclusion pilot project. Uh, in 2019, the client services community of practice action team of the business diversity sub cabinet, which is actually led by DSHS, found that client services represents a category of discretionary spend in the multi-million dollar range for 10 cabinet agencies. In fact, client services comprise the majority of DSHS spend, over 80%. However, client services spend has not been included in statewide business diversity participation reporting historically. Therefore, current diversity statistics do not reflect the state's actual spend in the diverse business marketplace. The inclusion of client services spend in OMWBE's annual business diversity participation report would improve the accuracy of business diversity participation reporting for the state of Washington and direct efforts to an underinvested area of economic growth. The demand for client services has increased due to the COVID-19 pandemic and projected to increase because of demographic shifts. The objective of our pilot project is to actually use our DSHS Agency Contracts Database Application or ACD system to determine how it could be used as a client services data source for B2G Now, which is OMWBE's business diversity uh, management system. If successful, accurate client service data spend uh, will be captured and included in statewide reporting, helping the state meet 21st century business realities and needs. Please feel free to contact me with any questions at the contact information provided. Uh, next slide, please. And thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much, Carolyn and Dana. Um, so uh, here we are, um, this is a time now where we'll have the governor joining us um, just momentarily. And so um, instead of uh, getting to the next presentation and, uh, and, and you know, cutting anyone short, um, we're just gonna go ahead and take a couple of moments. Um, uh, he should be joining us shortly. Um, and so when we get word, uh, oh, and word has come through. Look at that. I guess you just have to sort of talk about it, right? Manifest it. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to our director at OMWBE, Lisa Vanderloo, to um, introduce the governor. Hi, everybody. Hi, Governor. It's a pleasure to have you here with us today. Uh, thank you for uh, making this a priority. You know, I was thinking about this. This is really uh, your leadership in this area. This, I think, started in 2015. I was actually at Results Washington. 
and you'd heard from some stakeholders about barriers for procurement and contracting and and being who you are and equity being important, you uh, uh, created the sub cabinet on business diversity and Chris has led this for several years uh, with tremendous leadership. And, and you knew, you know, you've always felt that combating discrimination and ensuring that public money is equitably spent in the private sector uh, is important and, and the, the value that minority and women owned businesses bring to our economy, you are, you are aware of. So we so appreciate your leadership. And I, I just want to make sure that we call out, you know, the, these agencies, whether it's DES, WashDOT, LNI, HCA, DOC, uh, Veterans Affairs, the ethnic commissions, they've all been involved in this work under your leadership. So we're just so grateful to have you here to recognize the launch of this toolkit, toolkit in public equity. Uh, so I'll turn it over to you. Well, uh, thank you so much, Lisa. Thanks for your leadership. It's great to see what you've been doing for such a period of time. I know your mother and father would be very proud of your work as we are. Uh, because they were warriors for justice and now you're continuing to carry this torch and I think this toolkit is going to really move the needle in our state and it needs to. We know the systemic racism we face impedes our state to use its bountiful diversity and I think that's one of our great strengths in Washington state because we're one of the most diverse states in the country and we value that as a fundamental value of the Evergreen State. It's going, I believe this toolkit is going to really help us all uh, move the needle on this regard. And I want to say something. We know that this effort to increase opportunity is a justice issue. Uh, Martin Luther King talked about, you know, the arc of the moral universe is long, but always points to justice. The work this toolkit is doing is moving us along towards on that arc of the moral universe. But I do want to bring another reason why this work is important. Um, I remember, uh, uh, I won't even mention this person's name who ran for president, by the way, it wasn't me. Uh, 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 years back, he was talking about the issue of diversity. And he said, you know, if you're gonna have a crew team, you want, you want to have, uh, and if you got a strong rower, you want them in the boat rowing. And if you don't, if you deny talent from getting to part in your boat, you're, you're not gonna do as well. He said, this is about getting talent in the boat, pulling on the oars. And is, this is both a justice issue, but it also is a community benefit issue. We want talented contractors working with the Department of Transportation, building roads and bridges. That's talent. We want to get talent in, in the game. I just want to point out it is justice, but it's more than justice. It's productivity. It's having the best team on the field. We want talented you know, economic athletes on the field. And that's what this is about fundamentally. So I'm really excited about this. And we know there's talent out there that we need to get into the game, small businesses particularly. 99% of our businesses are small, women and veteran owned, members of uh, uh, communities of color owned. And we know there's talent out there that we haven't got working for the state yet. So I am convinced this is really gonna help us uh, move in, in that direction. We know obviously it's a family oriented thing as well. Uh, and it's a community oriented because these small businesses are part of their communities, right? These are not necessarily mega international conglomer conglomerations. They're small business people that can sponsor the parade and the little league team and are part of the community. So getting these folks uh, to have a, a decent economic opportunity is important to, to the, the communities that they uh, belong to. Um, now, we have a lot of work to do in this regard, and this group knows what I'm talking about. In 2020, only 3.5% of the nearly $5 billion that the state spent with the private sector were with small businesses owned by women, minorities, or veterans. And we know we can do better. We need, we have to do better, and we will do better. And I'm gonna do what I can to make sure that all our agencies understand the power of this toolbox and make sure they pick the tools up and use them. So that'll be an intensive part of my discussion with our leadership and our team to make sure they avail themselves of these tools. It's why we formed the Business Diversity Subcabinet in the first place. I selected 12 agencies uh, to participate in that. Six of these agencies make up two thirds of our total spending and contracting. So I'm convinced that we're gonna move the needle on this. Um, now, we want this to be long-term too, not just short-term. 
So these kind of things we want to embed in the culture of the state, not just one off, not just while I'm governor, frankly. We want to make this part of the, the uh, culture of the state of Washington to embed these tools. But I do believe that there's every reason to believe it's going to, it's going to uh, work. I also want to compliment everybody because I think these were actionable strategies. These were not just some kind of bumper sticker. When I've looked at them, they're things we can actually get done. So we're going to expect our agencies uh, uh, to use them uh, because they're going to be long-term success, I believe. So I just want to congratulate you, Lisa, Chris Liu, Regina Glenn, President and CEO of Pacific Communications, uh, an OMWBE certified business. She's a long-term member of the advisory committee, and I know she's going to take pride in seeing this work come to fruition. So thank you for your leadership, everybody on this call. Uh, this is going to redouble our effectiveness on something that is absolutely pivotal to the state of Washington. And uh, let's go make it happen now. Early to bed, early rise, work like hell and organize. Let's make sure we get this to, to be implemented. Thank you. And with that, I'm going to go out and uh, defeat COVID. And please take care of your own health, please. We'll see you guys. Oh, thank you, Governor Inslee. Well, if that was an inspirational, I don't know what. I'm going to go ahead and uh, resume our agency presentations. Um, so give me a moment to share my screen. All right, so uh, next up, we have the Department of Labor and Industry. So we have Annalise D'Angelo. Thank you, Yen. Good morning, everyone. My name is Annalise D'Angelo with the Department of Labor and Industries, as you know by now. <laughs> to open our presentation today, I'll read the following statement from our Deputy Director, Randy Warwick. Next slide, please. Dear colleagues, I regret that I cannot be with you in person today, but please know that I am very much with you in spirit. It makes my heart full to know that so many are involved in this event and in this important work. The events of the last year have been challenging to be sure, but with those challenges have come renewed opportunity and dialogue for meaningful change in many ways, especially in the areas of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Some of the best advice I've ever gotten was that it's so important to periodically pause, take a deep breath, reflect on the work, adjust where necessary, and then move forward with a renewed sense of purpose and energy. Although we have much more work to do, I appreciate this opportunity to recognize the achievements we've attained and the effort we have put in thus far. So many people were involved in the creation for the tools for equity in public spending and in the subcabinet's work. Some you've already heard about, some you'll hear about later. Let me take a moment to recognize a few of those individuals from LNI. Tammy Wilson has done a phenomenal job on the subcabinet policy action team. Her perspective and expertise was vital in creating model policies and resources that agencies can use to increase equity in state purchasing and contracting. Tammy and her procurement team continue to encourage our agency leadership and purchasing areas to consider diversity in every possible contract and purchase, providing expert guidance on risk and opportunity. I am so grateful for her and her team's efforts. Annalise D'Angelo, who is modest enough that it's probably uncomfortable for her to read these words on my behalf, <laughs> has been an active member at every one of these subcabinet meetings, helping guide the subcabinet in moving work forward as they weighed important policy decisions. We're lucky to have her. Achieving equity is a huge task, and huge tasks require team effort. I do not have time today to name each and every individual involved in this work, but know that all of your efforts are felt and appreciated. You all embody the shared LNI core values of respect, learning and growth, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. I have learned so much through this effort and continue to learn new things every day. The biggest takeaway is this. We will be better able to face the challenges and opportunities of tomorrow if we are able to create an environment where everyone's voice is heard and where we can all grow and thrive. Efforts like these are helping move us in the right direction. Thank you for your continued partnership, your shared sense of mission, 
and your ongoing passion for making our world a better place. Sincerely, Randy Warwick, Deputy Director, Labor and Industries. Next slide, please. So with those words to set our stage, I'd like to take a moment to reflect on our journey. LNI, like all state agencies, is committed to the values of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We strive for a holistic approach to this important work with strategies for both our internal and external facing efforts across all of our lines of business. For our supplier diversity focused efforts, Tammy and the LNI procurement team's time, expertise, and passionate participation in the communities of practice and action teams have helped to craft and refine toolkit items. Crystal Van Boven with our budget office developed an LNI spending dashboard so that we can better understand our data and make data driven decisions. For our holistic approach, many teams and programs across LNI are exploring ways to make it easier for small diverse businesses to engage with us. Some of the recent improvements we've made as a result of this work are, our prevailing wage program self-service applications now including OMWBE certification information, implementing more electronic versions of our paperwork and processes, 24 hour telephone lines for safety questions and concerns, expanding our language access services, providing COVID-19 language information in 36 languages on our website, and implementing online payment systems for processes that previously have required in-person interactions. Some of our internal or employee facing efforts have been agency-wide DEI listening sessions, employee resource groups, an implicit bias overview with more than 200 managers and supervisors from across all areas of the agency, as well as our current effort to reevaluate our key performance indicators. We've learned a lot from these efforts and applied those lessons as we continue our efforts to improve. Next slide, please. So that's where we've been, but what does it look like to move forward? Well, Elle and I will weave supplier diversity into our business planning. We're going to explore how we can best apply industry standards and best practices to increase supplier diversity. We're going to continue developing even more meaningful measures and more ways to view our data for continued clarity and decision making. And of course, we'll follow state HR DEI directives. Next slide, please. Labor and Industries is humbled to be a part of the sub cabinet for supplier diversity. We're excited to learn how we can best implement the disparity study recommendations to learn from others in the process and to share what we learn along the way. We know this journey is not over. As the governor just said, there, there's still a lot of work to do. So thank you for your time today and for your continued support, guidance and patience as we move this work forward together. Thank you, Annalise. Lovely words from yourself and from Randy. We definitely feel her spirit here with us today. Um, and with that, we'll turn it over to the Department of Transportation's Keith Metcalf and Earl Keith. Thank you. Um, as I'm the Deputy uh, Secretary of Transportation, uh, pleased to, to kick this off for the WatchDot segment. I also want to recognize that Amy Scarton is uh, participating in this meeting as a, a, a behind the scenes. Uh, she will be taking my place as deputy as I'll be retiring at the end of the February. So I wanted to recognize that she's here and ready to get started with that hard, that difficult work of uh, running an agency and, and all the important things that go with that. Um, I do uh, want to tell you that the WashDOT has been actively engaged in uh, diversity for a while here as uh, under Secretary Millar's leadership. We have established three goals uh, as a part of our strategic plan. They are workforce development, practical solution, and inclusion, which includes all of the DEI uh, issues um, for the department. And so at, uh, under the governor and, and Secretary Millar's leadership, uh, we have spearheaded many efforts to enhance socially and economically disadvantaged individuals that are participating in WashDOT uh, contracting. Some of the efforts include Secretary Millar's effort to take this national, the 18 Western states, and, as well as the National Association of Tra Highway and Transportation Officials. He put together uh, resolutions, got them passed for address addressing systemic racism. We're working internally on executive order and uh, other ways to make sure we are an anti-racism um, agency. Uh, and we're also, 
uh, pleased with our spend as far as what we've accomplished as far as the minority and women expenditures for our state and federal programs. We've uh, spent, we've paid out over $75 million to small minority and women and veteran owned businesses in our state funded program, as well as another $47 million, and these are in 2020 uh, expenditures, another 47 million in federal funds, uh, part of that federally funded program. We're grateful for our partners uh, with the Office of Minority and Women in Business Enterprises for their guidance and participation in our programs. And I, uh, before I turn it over to Earl, I wanna make sure I recognize the folks uh, within our organization that has been instrumental in, in uh, developing uh, our sub-cabinet toolkit. Uh, from our agency, some are past employees, some are currently with us, but our Oscar Surde, uh, Craig McDaniel, Denny Tack, uh, Edwina Martin-Arnold, Allison Spector, Hector Meneses, uh, Dave Davis, and a special thanks to Jackie Bain and the leadership under the lead, all under the leadership of Earl Key, who is our director of Office of Equal Opportunity. And he is now going to discuss the, the WashDOT state funded contracts, the diversity roadmap. So Earl, take it over. Thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, let me start off by saying I'd like to thank um, Secretary for, uh, Millar for his commitment to diversity, equity, inclusion, along with the, our Deputy Secretary, Keith Metcalf, um, whom you just heard from. In addition, a special thanks to Jackie Bain, who has worked tirelessly on helping us with these issues. Um, looking at the diversity roadmap, this is WashDOT's diversity roadmap. And if you look at the chart on the right, um, you can see where we're at today. Um, back in 19, for example, we've had 3.8% spend with on our state funded contracts with minorities. And then in 2020, that went up to 5.9%. One thing I'm proud about is during uh, Secretary Millar's tenure, that number has risen every single year. So we are doing much better than what we were, but we're still not where we want to be. And that is the purpose of this roadmap. So if you take a look on the left, this is where we are today. Um, the column on the left um, are all the voluntary measures that we currently have in place right now. And we're determining progress by that box on the left. That, those are the metrics that we're going to be looking at to evaluate our program. And then if you go down a little bit, are we seeing progress um, to the governor's goals? And the answer to that question is right now, no. So we're going to the next phase of the roadmap. We're going to more gender neutral means we're going to be looking at putting a mandatory small business and veterans owned business mandatory goals. And since it's race neutral, we can make those mandatory goals. That's the phase we're in now. We are designing that program. I expect that program to be uh, completely fully implemented on our state funded contracts, uh, probably by May 1, um, unless we can get it done sooner. If we are seeing progress and we're getting the numbers the way where we want them, then we stay with what we've been doing. Um, we, we, we will do nothing else. But if we're not, at that point, we will, in consultation with the Attorney General's office, uh, be moving to race and gender conscious measures. Meaning, uh, we're very unique because we have a federal program in our federal contracting um, where we can put mandatory goals based on race and gender. As a matter of fact, we have to do it as a part of our disadvantaged business program. And we know that when you have goals that use race and gender and are enforceable goals, we do a lot better. Um, as a matter of fact, WashDOT has been doing the disparity studies for a number of years now. They're mandated. And when we do these disparity studies, we put in our state funded contracts as well as our federally funded contracts. And so far, what we know is that when you have mandatory enforceable goals based on race and gender, you do a lot better. Our contract participation drops over 60% from our federal to our state funded contracts. Um, and that's because we do not have the race and gender goals on those state funded contracts. And we're doing everything we can race neutrally to try to balance it out and get us where we need to be. 
Um, we're going to be gearing up to do another disparity study um, over the next year. Um, and then we'll evaluate it. And as I said, if we cannot do it race neutrally, we will consult with the attorney general's office and we will move to uh, race and gender conscious. I believe WashDOT has been at this longer um, than anyone else. I believe that we have met all the criteria we will have based on the attorney general's opinion. And so we should probably be, if there is a necessity to go to race and gender conscious goals, WashDOT will probably be the first out of the gate to attempt it. So stay tuned. Thank you. Turning it back over to OMWBE. Thank you so much, Earl. Thank you, Keith. Um, next, we have uh, the Healthcare Authority. Uh, presenting will be Rochelle Amory. Rochelle? I'm on mute, aren't I? Sorry. Good morning, everybody. This is Rochelle Amrang, Contracts Administrator for the Healthcare Authority. Um, I first want to say that I am so pleased and honored that I was invited here today to present HCA's 2021 Action Plan. HCA, along with all of our partner agencies, has a strong commitment to combating discrimination and putting into play equitable practices that open opportunities for all businesses. As the state's largest healthcare purchaser, we contract with many entities to provide high quality, affordable, and accessible health care for more than 2.5 million Washington residents. At HCA, we also know that government can be a powerful and proactive force for equity and inclusion, and agency leadership buy-in is key and pivotal um, for forward-moving progress. With that, I'd like to recognize and thank HCA agency leadership, um, specifically Sue Birch, our agency director, Lou McDermott, our deputy director, who's on this call today and did not know I was going to be recognizing him. Jody Costello, our administrative services director and Annette Schiffenhauer, our chief legal officer. I oversee all the contracting activity at HCA and I can say that hands down, I have never felt more supported in doing our part for equity and inclusion. Whenever I've approached any of these folks um, with different initiatives I wanna take or tools I wanna implement, policies I wanna visit, or even visible metrics that I want displayed. Without hesitation, I've received approval, encouragement, and when possible, resources. All four of these people are involved in the day-to-day -day agency decision-making on where we're going to allocate our resources, our time, and our energy. They have identified equity and inclusion as one of the top agency priorities. Their devotion to equity and inclusion expands further than contracting and procurement. It dips into and touches just about every program and division in our agency where possible. Currently, we have out on the street a recruitment for a health equity manager. This individual will be key in putting an equity lens on all of our procurements um, to ensure that we're doing our best um, to provide equitable access to all Washingtonians. Currently, HCA has a number of things that we've already put in place um, to try and increase equity and inclusion in our contracting. We've spent countless hours revisiting and revamping our contract solicitations and templates. Um, uh, with the goal of making them less cumbersome and overall easier to respond to. We've set agency goals. Um, we've included inclusion plans in all of our competitive procurements. Um, we've also posted all of our solicitations on OMWBE's website um, to ensure that those vendors out there who may not be registered in the statewide bidder notification system um, have access to those. In fact, we have one out there right now. Um, all of these things that we've put into place have heated results, um, but HCA is definitely a proactive agency and we want to do even more in 2021 to exceed expectations. Um, and so with that, I am pleased to present our 2021 action plan. Next slide, please. Our 2021 action plan includes four specific goals, each of which I'll talk a little bit more about in their own individual slides. But just to highlight, um, we are enhancing our internal training and data collection and projection efforts. Um, we're uh, looking at even more improvements in our contracting processes. Um, and uh, we're looking at client services in particular when it comes to spend goals. Um, we're also enhancing our outreach efforts that are currently in place. Next slide, please. So our first goal is enhancing our internal operations to better support equity in, in, in contracting. 
Currently, OMWBE is putting the final uh, finishing touches on some model policies, um, which will be presented to each agency um, for adoption. Um, HCA was played a large part in developing those model policies. And once they're issued out to the agencies, we fully anticipate um, taking them, putting an HCA spin on them, and adopting them within our agency. Uh, subsequent to that, um, I myself will be leading some training efforts to all of our agency procurement staff and contract managers on those internal policies. Um, secondly, and something I'm very excited about, um, in May, HCA will be launching an automated contract request portal for our internal users. Right up front and in the beginning stages, um, there will be a link um, to OMWBE certified, uh, certified vendor um, list. So the agency contract managers, those that are the ones making the decisions on who we contract with, will have upfront access um, to diverse vendors. Um, we are also improving all of our data and reportings for the divisions. Um, currently, we're building out reports um, to present visual depictions of where we're at, not only at the agency level, but at the division level, um, and spend with our small and diverse businesses. Um, we're creating reports on diversity and small business spend broken down by direct buy versus master contract versus competitive. Um, we all know that this is important because looking at the data in that way will really show where HCA has a big opportunity um, to uh, uh, spend some focus and energy um, on increasing inclusion. Um, and lastly, and something I'm also very excited about is we're creating division-specific contract portfolios, um, which will include not only all of the contracts that each division currently has, but their historical spend data. Um, and I will be visiting with agency um, directors biannually to forecast based on their historical spend. Next slide, please. Looking externally, we know that we can improve our efforts to support small and veteran-owned businesses in responding to procurements. Um, we're working to simplify our templates, remove legalese, and any unnecessary requirements so that responding to our solicitations is possible for smaller entities. We've been working on this some, for some time, but we do feel like there is more work to be done. Um, we're also uh, we're also looking to support businesses by ensuring that they get paid promptly. Um, this will come in the form of contractual requirements to our prime contractors. Um, they will be required and held to paying their subs promptly. Um, we're also exploring opportunities where HCA can take on some of the risk for these small businesses so they're not shouldering all that burden. Specifically, we're visiting our insurance, indemnification, and limitation of liability clauses to right size those clauses to the actual contract. Um, and lastly, one thing that we're looking at is uh, including language in our contracts that will allow HCA to monitor and audit contract prime contractor uh, compliance with inclusion plans that they submitted during their competitive solicitation process. Next slide, please. And lastly, we're looking at enhancing our Sorry. We're establishing spin goals for our client service contracts. I know that DSH has touched on this, and I was really excited to see all of the work that they're doing in the client service contract realm. Um, currently, uh, we're putting a lot of focus and energy into collecting data on our provider's certified status. We're looking at monitoring their spend and providing quarterly reports out to the divisions on where they're at with this. Um, we're doing this in collaboration with OMWBE as clearly it's a, it's a statewide issue um, and we want to make sure that we're partnering with all of the agencies that this touches to make sure we're all in alignment. Next slide, please. And lastly, enhanced outreach efforts. <clears throat> clearly, this last year was a bit difficult um, to attend outreach events. We're really hopeful that attendance this year will be less challenging. Um, we know that OMWB has a list of events out there that are currently scheduled. HCA uh, anticipates signing up for all of those and coming fully prepared with materials on upcoming procurements. Um, we're also looking at spend visibility um, and enhancing our external facing website so that potential bidders have the, the opportunity to look at where HCA has been spending their money and where they're looking at going. Um, additionally, on that same page, um, we're looking at early notifications on upcoming opportunities. 
I had mentioned earlier um, that I'll be doing biannual meetings with division directors to understand upcoming procurements that they have on the horizon. Um, my intent is to be able to get that notice out as early as possible um, to bidders to give them the opportunity to ramp up and, um, and look at other historical spend data to see if this is something that they're interested um, in participating in. Um, HCA being a heavy client service agency, um, our providers belong to a lot of listservs. We fully anticipate issuing out early notice um, as soon as possible um, on those listservs. Um, and also lastly, um, early notification um, and early identification of need um, for a procurement will provide the agency more time in our solicitation schedule to allow for bidders to actually put together um, their proposals and submit them to HCA. So thank you. I'm really excited about what 2021 has in store for us. And I was really excited to hear the other agencies' plans as well. So I appreciate your time and thank you. Thank you so much, Rochelle. So exciting to hear all of the things that HCA is doing. Um, next and uh, final uh, sub-cabinet agency member is going to be the Department of Corrections, where we'll hear from Jeannie Miller and Anita Kendall. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jeannie Miller, as mentioned. I'm the Assistant Secretary of the over the Administrative Operations Division within the Department of Corrections. Like many here today, I'm honored to be here to not only represent the commitment of our agency to expand the opportunities to minority women, small and veteran businesses, but also to recognize the staff who've contributed their talent and expertise to building the tools necessary to support progress in business diversity. Those individuals are Tom George, our assistant comptroller, Steve Wagman and Shannon Lamb, both procurement and supply specialists and Billy Peterson, our policy program manager. I would also like to recognize Secretary Sinclair, Deputy Secretary Julie Martin and Dr. Karen Johnson, our equity inclusion administrator for their relentless commitment to building an equitable and diverse culture within the department. At this time, I'm going to turn this over to Anita Kendall, our agency comptroller, who continues to show tremendous leadership in this area and has been instrumental in the development and implementation of our business diversity roadmap. Anita. Thank you, Jeannie. Good morning. As Jeannie said, I'm Anita Kendall. So I'm the comptroller for the department. I'm going to spend my time today sharing with you the department's diversity roadmap. This format might look a little familiar as you just saw Department of Transportation and I appreciate them sharing. We're committed to these efforts, but have not been doing it as long as some of the other agencies on this call. Um, well, COVID-19 interrupted our efforts and slowed progress. The department has made uh, progress towards our goals, but not to the extent that we'd like. Our results are in the upper right-hand corner um, with green being uh, this year's, this last year's results. Um, I'm gonna spend the more, majority of my time today though in the upper left-hand corner to talk about uh, the box labeled today. When we developed our 2021 inclusion plan, we kept in mind the components of the toolkit in building our strategies for the upcoming year. I'd like to share those with you now. Forecasting purchases, looking at our discretionary spend to identify opportunities for diverse vendors. Working with DES to continue to explore unbundling of our public works contracts for the department. Monitoring our procurement and contracting practices using procurement data and reporting. Our progress is, is displayed in that blue shaded box, and that is how we're measuring progress and our success. We will be comparing the forecasted purchases to the mandatory state contracts. And as you know, there are options or choices on the, a lot of the contracts for a diverse uh, vendor. We'll be incorporating uh, the model policies into our department policies, incorporating those best practices. 
And I'm really excited. One of the things that we are going to do this year is to develop some staff training on existing supplier bias. This training would go beyond our, just our purchasing professionals to target all department staff with the goal of changing our procurement culture. We want staff to consider new vendors in the marketplace and not to fall back on those who we've always ordered from. We want staff to get in the habit of looking for more diverse options. And lastly, we, can, we will continue to partner with OMWBE on these efforts and to seek assistance in certifying new vendors. As Jeannie mentioned earlier, the department and our executive team is committed to expanding opportunities to minority women, small and veteran businesses. We believe this work matters and that small businesses are essential to the success of our communities and accomplishing our mission at the Department of Corrections. We hope these strategies will make a difference in, in working towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you, Jeannie. Thank you, Anita. Uh, so it's back to me. Uh, for next steps, we have, um, again, the tools for equity and public spending um, support sessions. And uh, just a quick review, we have four different categories of uh, support sessions that will be introduced quarterly. The initial in introductory meeting um, will be to meet the subject matter experts that created this tool, learn why these tools are needed and ideas for successful implementation. Then we have a first support session afterwards, which will be a month later. Um, you can join your colleagues from different agencies, share your plans for implementation, ask questions, share ideas. And then at the third session, um, a month after that, will be to share your implementation progress, lessons learned, and successes. Ask questions and network with colleagues from different agencies also joining in this work. And at the end of the, this session, agencies should have implemented these tools and are ready for the next set of tools. So that is our next steps. Uh, we are um, ahead of schedule here. So uh, being that we are ahead of schedule, um, I'd like to invite any final remarks, if there are any, from the panelists. Okay, hearing none. Thank you so much everyone for joining us today. Um, truly, truly, what an achievement. Um, and as you've heard from all of the agencies and Governor Inslee himself, we are taking this moment to recognize um, all of the, the culmination of all of these efforts um, from various agencies and individuals um, and celebrating it. And then onward, and continue uh, this work. So uh, please send any questions or comments to equitytoolkit at omwb.wa.gov. And we look forward to uh, our continued partnership and seeing you at one of our support sessions. Thank you so much and have a great day. We are adjourned.